With that said, I'm going to begin reading at verses 11 and 12 here in chapter 16. And I'll give you a little bit of a background, again, a reminder, and uh, then we'll move into our study. What we're looking at is the foundation or the birth of the Church of Philippi. And uh, we're going to be seeing an event that takes place here, uh, first with a, a woman named Lydia, and then uh, an event that takes place uh, right after that. And so, beginning at verse 11, reading to verse 12 and introducing our study, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. And so, as we've already seen, um, the Apostle Paul and uh, a man that he loved very much, a man by the name of Barnabas, have had a falling out. They had the falling out over Barnabas' cousin, a young man by the name of John Mark. Now, Paul had been in the city of Antioch in the uh, country of Syria, and he'd been there for around a year. It was time for him to leave. It was time for him to go and to minister in uh, the churches where he had, that he had planted to see how the people in those churches were doing. He, he knew that it would take careful nurturing and careful time in the Word for these young disciples to grow, to mature. And the fact is that, that churches that are neglected easily will fall apart if they're not cared for. So Paul was ready to go, but, but Barnabas, his dear friend, wanted to take with him his cousin Mark. And as we saw, Paul disagreed with this, and so they divided over that, and they, de they developed actually two different ministry teams. Barnabas took John Mark, and he sailed to the island of Cyprus, which is to the, uh, the uh, southwest uh, uh, or so of, uh, of Turkey, of the, the nation of Turkey. But Paul took uh, a man by the name of Silas, and he went through uh, uh, Syria and Cilicia. In other words, he went to the southeast. Now, they came to a city in modern Turkey uh, called Mysia. From there, they went to Troas, and Troas was a port on the uh, northwest border of Turkey. So while in Troas, Paul had received a vision. This is a vision, the Scripture says, of a man of Macedonia. Notice verse 9. It says, A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And so um, he, he knew that God had called them to go preach to these Greeks, these Macedonians. So, Paul, Silas, and Timothy are now joined by Luke, and as a unified ministry team, they're boarding a ship, and they went together to the work, and that's where we left off last time we were together. So, he says in verse 11, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis. And so, they're embarking on a short ministry journey, and if you were looking at a map, you'd be looking at the Mediterranean Mediterranean would be to the uh, west of, of the nation of Turkey. Turkey would be north of uh, the nation of Israel, if you will, and to the north and the northwest. And so they're going across the Mediterranean, and they're on their way now to an area called Macedonia. So they first stop in a place called Samothrace. It's an island, probably spent the night there in a port. They came to a place called Neapolis, which is on the Greek coast in, Medi uh, in uh, Macedonia, and then they move on to a city called Philippi. That was about 10 or 12 miles inland. It was northwest of Neapolis. So what we have here is the gospel entering for the first time into Europe. It's interesting that it was a man of Macedonia who had said, come and help us. But when Paul arrives, he actually is ministering to a woman, a woman by the name of Lydia. And so it says they were staying in that city for a while on the Sabbath day, verse 13, we went out uh, of the city to the riverside. So they went to Greg Laurie's church and where <laughs> prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. And so I'll develop this a little bit with you. Normally, as we've been seeing this, and even Paul's, Paul even writes this to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, the practice of Paul in his ministry was to go first to the Jewish population. So the gospel was for the whole world, but Paul, because he had a, a heart for his Jewish brethren, according to the flesh, he would go to a synagogue. 
And as he would go to the synagogue, he would first go and minister to them. But again, he was open to ministering to whoever who would listen to the gospel. And so normally he would first go to a synagogue to share with his fellow Jews. But the absence of a synagogue, pointing out here that they were at a riverside, tells us there's no synagogue. And it tells us there were very few Jewish people there in that area. And how we know this is very simple. It took 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue. So instead of meeting in a synagogue, they're meeting at a riverside and they're praying there. That would be considered an unofficial meeting place. So it's a prayer meeting. It's made up of Jews as well as what you would call God-fearers who were Gentiles. And in this prayer meeting, there's a Gentile woman, a woman that we're introduced to here by the name of Lydia. It says in verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. And she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. By the way, it says but who worshipped God. That tells us two things. One, she's from Thyatira, which is a, um, it's a, a Gentile city. It's on the coast there in Turkey. And that she worships God tells us that she wasn't Jewish, but that she was a God-fearer. God-fearers were those who, who liked the moral teachings of the Jewish um, rabbis and all, but were not fully converted. They were not Jewish. They didn't convert to Judaism. They basically were Gentiles who embraced uh, the, the moral, moral teachings of, uh, of the Jews. And so that's who she is. And it tells us that she's a seller of purple. And uh, it, it says something I want to develop here. Notice in verse 14, it says, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. And when you read your Bible, the word heard, it doesn't mean much to you. It probably wouldn't. Why? Because the way we use the word here in the United States, the way we use the word heard, uh, isn't something that's going to give us much information. But you need to remember that in the New Testament, it was written with a, a language called Greek, Koine Greek, Common Greek. And it actually has a deeper meaning than just listening. Uh, it, it says that she heard us and she was listening very intently. She was hearing the message that Paul was sharing. She was listening and, and was understanding the heart of the message. She was listening with great observation. She was thirsting, it's telling us. She was longing for truth and it's a truth that would set her free. So this is a person who's listening, who's hearing with intensity. Not just kind of like sometimes people are in church where they're just there, you know, it's the time we go to church, but I've got other things. I've got to roast in the oven, or I've got to go wash my car or mow the lawn. She wasn't doing that. She was a Gentile. She was a woman who went to prayer because she had a desire to know God. She didn't embrace fully the God of Israel. She didn't convert fully. She was a God-fearer, but she was intensely listening to the things that the Apostle Paul was saying. She was not indifferent. She wanted to know what he was saying, she was understanding the heart of the message. She was thirsting. She's longing for truth. She wants the truth that is going to set her free. So she's not indifferent. She's a worshiper of God. She's a God-fearer. Now, it says that she was originally from Thyatira. When you read your Bible in the book of Revelation, it speaks of the seven churches. And the seven churches, one of the seven churches is Thyatira. It was on, it, it was on the uh, Turkish side. It was in Turkey. And uh, it was one of the seven churches that later on were spoken to. She's from that city. It's on the western coast there in Turkey. Now, she's living in Philippi. And Philippi uh, was, again, there on, in, in Macedonia. And she's a, notice, a, a seller of purple. Now, purple is an expensive dye. It, it, it's very valuable. And so that tells us something else. And I'm trying to build something with you here. She was a Gentile God-fearer who was wealthy because she sold purple, and purple was a very expensive dye. But her wealth did not satisfy her. The money she had did not satisfy the longing of her heart. It didn't meet the thing that meant most to her. It didn't reach the deepest part of her. You know, sometimes when we're Younger, perhaps, we think, well, I'll get a job, not based on whether it's something I enjoy doing or want to do or would like to make a career of because it's really what I feel I'm called to do, but I'm going to look for a job that will produce the most income that I can have. Why? Well, because we think that if we have money, we're going to also have happiness, and, you know, it doesn't buy the things that matter. There were four prophets that uh, have said this. Uh, 
They said, money can't buy me love. They were the Beatles. <laughs> John, Paul, George, and Ringo, the four apostles. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, she knew that there was something more than what she has. She knew that money might buy you things, and of course it does, and grateful to God for it. But it doesn't meet your deepest longing. We're going through the book of Ecclesiastes, and I'd invite you to be part of that on Wednesdays. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 7 says it like this, All the labor of man is for his mouth, yet the soul is not satisfied. It's something that you eat. It's something that satisfies you in that way. Your physical appetites are met, but your spiritual hungers are not. So what you put on, what you drink, what you eat are all necessities, of course, but they aren't the most important thing. The most important thing is the Lord satisfying your spiritual need. Lydia was wealthy, but she was longing for something else. This is a spiritually hungry Gentile woman who is open to the things of God, and she knew that everything she ever gained would one day be simply left behind. You don't take it with you. Ecclesiastes 2.21 says, There is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. You work all your life. You get up early. You work late. You gain all this finance. You get all this influence. You gain this affluence. But in the back of your mind, as you're growing older, you know you're going to leave your business behind to someone who didn't work one day to develop it. A friend of mine was talking about that. I shared this on Wednesday night a couple of weeks ago. A friend of mine was saying, you know, when the day comes for me to, to move out of ministry full-time and to hand my fellowship that, that God gave me to develop, I'm going to hand my fellowship over to somebody who didn't do a thing to develop this ministry, didn't cry one time for this church. And that's a fact. You leave it behind to somebody else. Everything you do is left behind. And she knows that. All the money that she has, all the things she has. And you'll see she's a wealthy woman. We'll see that in a moment. It, it, there's even a more uh, obvious uh, thing we'll see in a minute. But she knew her wealth wouldn't satisfy. She was there listening. She would go to the prayer meeting and she'd hear and make her prayers made to God and all and hear the other prayers. And, and, and here comes the Apostle Paul and he's sharing a message and she's hearing him. She's listening intently. According to John chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus said, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed a seal of approval, food that spoils. We had our family over for Christmas dinner, a horde, greedy little things, and they came over, and it's like locusts descended on my house. <laughs> but there's food left over. And at the end, where does that food go? It goes into the trash, right? It goes into the trash. That's where it goes. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't labor for the food that spoils. You have an abundance of it. Thank God you do. But you don't eat all of it. Don't labor for that kind of food. He said, labor for the food that endures to eternal life. You get that from me, he's saying, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father placed the seal of approval. And so the Lord Jesus made that very clear. In John 6, 35, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You're not going to hunger for spiritual truth or thirst for spiritual truth because Jesus satisfied those things. He satisfies those things that you have in your, in your heart. When I got saved, I didn't go and see what Muhammad had to say. When I got saved, I didn't go and try and hear what Buddha had to say. I didn't need to hear that. I already was satisfied. I didn't want anything else. I was satisfied. And that's what Jesus is saying. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Why? Because I'm the bread of life. I will meet, I will satisfy 
your inner longings, the hungers of your heart. So Paul came to a prayer meeting. And while he's there, he's sharing about Jesus and he's preaching the gospel and, and, and Lydia is there and she's listening intently. And something inside of her begins to respond. Something inside is like deep calling unto deep. Something he's saying, something within is beginning to respond to. It's drawing her. It's like Paul is speaking just to her. It's like she's the only person in that room. Even though she's with few other ladies and all it's like she's the only one there at the riverside I've had people approach me after a bible study and they've said you know I, I know there were other people around me but I, I also know that God was speaking straight to me today his word spoke to my heart that's what Lydia was doing she was seeking God she was at a prayer meeting it may be that even in her prayer she was saying God I want to know you Jesus in Matthew 7, verse 7, said it like this. He said, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And so Paul is speaking, and he's sharing that God sent his son. He's speaking at the right moment in the right period of time. God sent his son. He's, spoken, he's speaking about how, how Jesus was born of a virgin. And that he dwelt in Israel and, and that he grew to be a man and he did miracles and he was speaking of his teachings and, and how they took him and they put him on a cross and they put him to death and yet he was buried and the third day he, he was raised from the and he's sharing the gospel and as she's listening to this, God begins to work on her. God is moving on her heart. Notice verse 14. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. The Spirit of God convicted her. He opened her heart, convicted her within the core of her being. Lydia was in the right place to receive what Paul was sharing. And as she's listening, she knows that what he's saying is true. Like the two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus, her, her heart began to burn with, within her. And as she, she heard, she believed, and God opened her heart to heed what Paul said. And that, that word heed, in verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to heed. The word heed means to respond. It, it, it means to act upon. It's not just listening. You see, a lot of people hear Bible studies, but they're really not heeding. They're not acting upon it. They hear it with their ear, but they don't receive it within. They Oh, yeah, that's a good idea, or that's neat. Sometimes when they're convicted, they'll go, oh, yeah, that's his opinion. I remember two young ladies who came to a Bible study on a Wednesday night. And it just so happened I was in a pas passage that was speaking concerning um, homosexuality. And, I, you know, you teach the word as it is. And so she contacted me. And uh, she said to me, um, Pastor David, I want you to know something. She said, my, uh, my girlfriend and I she came, she was lesbian, my girlfriend and I came to, uh, to the Wednesday night. She said, we don't go to your church, we were invited to come to the fellowship, and so we came. And you were teaching about the sin that is my sin. And she goes, I went home, and I spoke to my partner, and I said, what we're doing is wrong. The Bible teaches it's wrong. My partner said, and I remember this conversation very well. She said, my partner said, oh, that's just his opinion. Because that's what a lot of people do. They, they listen if they don't agree with that. Well, that's his opinion. Even if it's very black and white, well, that's his opinion. Or that's an old book. It doesn't matter. That's, you know, today's different. We have all of these arguments. But she said, I knew that it was true. And I told her. No, what he said, he didn't make that up. I read it myself today. She said that. And she broke up with this partner of hers. She got married. She has children. She, she was set free. Why? Because God opened her heart to hear what the Spirit has to say. Because the truth will set you free. And Lydia is there, and she's listening, and God is opening her heart. And she responds. She heeds. She applies herself to this. 
And God graciously grants to her the free gift of salvation. You see, by the Holy Spirit, God opened her, her eyes of understanding to believe in Jesus Christ. In John 6, and 45, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up at the last day. It's written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. And that's what's taking place. She's listening, and God is opening her heart. Listen, it's, it's not as if he's forcing her heart open. She went with an attitude to receive. She went, because I want to know. She's listening to this man who's speaking to these women at a prayer meeting. And as she's listening, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon her, and she knows that what he's saying is true. She's listening. Well, as she's listening in verse 15, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. She persuaded us. So she heard what was being taught. There's no doubt that in the conversation, in the sharing, in the teaching, preaching of the Apostle Paul, that he mentioned that Jesus had said, uh, go out to all the nations and uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you, Lord, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. There's no doubt that he spoke of baptism because she is saying, uh, I want to be baptized, I, I, and because the scripture says that she, she and her household were baptized. So her desire to follow Christ is revealed by an open demonstration of faith. There are There are no real secret Christians really here in the United States, shouldn't be. By being baptized, she openly declared that she's a follower of Christ. It's revealing to us that she is, she's knowing that she had been dead to sin, but now is alive because of the work of the Spirit within her. She's actually evidencing genuine salvation. And and she's desiring more of God. Notice verse 15, how it says that, uh, She says, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. She persuaded us. She's so overjoyed to have heard the gospel, she wants to know more. She's actually begging, saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord. Her hunger is for more teaching. Again, that is an evidence of a real salvation. When you're really saved, you want to know more about God. That's basic, isn't it? When you really saved, for me, it was not a once in a while thing. When I first got saved, it was, I need to know more. I, I want to have more. The way it was prior to getting saved, and again, I was only 20 years old at that time, but my lifestyle was when I'm partying. I love to party, and obviously a lot of people did, and many still do. But for me, it was like, where's the next party? You know, you could party every day. I discovered that, and I tried to do that. I I enjoyed partying, go to somebody's house and do what you do. But when I got saved, it it changed. Now is, where's the next Bible study? Where's the next place we can go for fellowship? And and we had a day-by-day, everyday kind of thing where we were together, where the church was together. That was, by the way, part of the what people today look at and call the Jesus Revolution. We call it the Jesus Movement. It was that he made up everything for us. We wanted to know him, so we gathered together, and that's what she's saying. She's saying, I want you to come to my house. She's persuading them. Listen, if you, if you trust that I really have been saved, then please come to my house and, and stay. I, I want more teaching. I want to know more, and, and, and it would be great to have you staying with us. That way I have access to you. I can ask my questions, and, and you can disciple me and, and my household. I, I want more of you. When I got saved, it would have been nice to have had Pastor Chuck Smith living in my house so I could say, well, Chuck, what about this, and how about that? And that's kind of what she was doing on a greater degree. It was with the Apostle Paul. I, I want to know you. I want to know more about God, and, 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 and the eagerness is, is there. On Christmas uh, morning, we came for our Christmas morning service, and, and my wife and I, Marie and I, were talking, and she said something that stuck with me. She said to me, I said, well, it's, it's great to go to church on Christmas Day, isn't it? And she said, uh, what could be better? 
than going to church. And I was blessed to hear my wife say that because she has to come and hear me. (laughs) But the question is real, isn't it? What could be better? There are a whole lot of people who will say there's a lot of things that are better. Oh, I'd better do this. I'd I'd rather go to the game. I'd rather do this. I'd rather do that. I'd rather go to the beach. I'd rather. There's a lot of people that would say there's a lot of things that are better. And that kind of reveals our hearts for God. It reveals our depth of relationship with him very clearly. If I can find alternatives, you know, make excuses to not be there, it tells me where my heart really is. For her, she wanted to be there. She wants to know God. So she invites Paul, Luke, Silas, and Timothy to stay. She wants to have them with her that they might teach her. They more than likely at this time were staying in a rented place but she wants, to, she wants to free them from having to pay any kind of rent. And uh, in doing so, she's revealing something about herself. She's revealing that she's a wealthy woman. She has a large enough home to lodge them. And so it's demonstrating her generosity. And so she asks them, could you stay with me in my place? And, and here's something that I also love about this, something else about Lydia as a woman. She has the privilege to be Paul's first convert in Europe. The very first convert in Europe. And this is also the planting of the very first church in Europe. You see, after she was saved, her home became a place for believers to gather. And ultimately, it became the way the church in the city of Philippi was established. And we may not know the word Philippi that well, but we know the book of Philippians. And that book would have been written concerning a church that we saw birthed here, and it was birthed in a house. Many churches begin in homes, by the way. This church began in a home. This church began in a home as a Bible study in, uh, in Pomona, and then ultimately began Sunday services in a home in Ontario. A lot of churches were were built or originated in a home. And this church, the Church of the Philippians, did too. And so that's the first part. Here's your second message, beginning at verse 16. It happened. As we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation, and this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now, what we're seeing here is a spiritual battle. And you see where it actually begins. It begins as they went to prayer. And that's where many spiritual battles take place. You see, God answers faith-filled prayers. And because he does, the enemy is in constant opposition. I want you to see this. Notice how it says, on their way to prayer, they encountered a slave girl. This slave girl was following them and crying out. We were in Jerusalem Several years ago now, Mike McIntosh, Holland Davis, and I and our wives, we were in the city of Jerusalem, and we were walking, and our wives were up ahead scouting out places to buy stuff. (laughs) They were walking ahead of us. And as they were walking ahead, Mike and Holland and I were talking. And directly behind us, maybe 30 feet or less, was a woman who was following behind us. At first, you didn't notice her, but she got close enough to us for us to hear her voice. And she was muttering and speaking and speaking out loud. And she was saying, I don't know. I still remember some of what she was saying when I finally could hear her words. I don't know. Some say that he is the son of God. Some say he is God. And we, our ears picked up on what she was doing. 
and we slowed down. And then Mike looks at Holland, and he says, Holland, go with the women. <laughs> so he scurries off with the ladies. And Mike turns to me, and he says, she's demon-possessed. And I said, I better go with Holland. <laughs> Make sure he gets there safely. <laughs> so he turns, and he says, she's demon-possessed. And I said, yeah. And then Mike, this is Mike, he says, you want to go cast a demon out? That's Mike. Well, I was getting a hamburger, but... So I said, okay. I said, of course. So we stop. And the woman stops. She's doing something very similar to... You know, sometimes people read the Bible and say, oh, that happened 2,000 years ago. We're in Jerusalem... There's a woman behind us. She's muttering about Christ. She's speaking perfect English. And we turn and look at her. And Mike says in the name of Jesus to her. And she stops. Freezes. And I'm not, I, I, it was very dramatic. I'm not making it dramatic. It was. She stops and kind of freezes in her steps and looks at us. And then turns and scurries away. So we start following her going after her. Mike's a step ahead of me, but we're going. And she keeps rushing away from us. These kinds of things still happen. These kinds of things are real. This is not a storybook. This isn't fiction. This isn't a myth. This is not a fable. This is not a scary story. This is real. Paul is walking this woman with the spirit of divination, we'll look at that in a moment. I'll explain to you a little bit about that. She begins to say things. These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she's following them several days doing this. She is, notice, possessed with the spirit of divination. In other words, her body has been taken over by an outside intelligence, a demon. And this is the spirit of divination. I'll explain that to you a little bit in a moment. But it's a demon that pretends to be able to predict future events. We need to remember that there are satanic forces. Satan left heaven. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. A third of the angelic host followed him. He now has uh, oversight, if you will, commands, legions. Um, uh, spiritual entities that are explained to us in Ephesians chapter 6 when it talks about the various world rulers and all. And so he is what Jesus called the ruler of this, this age, the prince of this world. He has demonic authority. It's all subject to Christ, but he has minions, demons, who basically follow after his lead. He has them. His tail took a, thousand, uh, uh, a third of the angels, as I mentioned. And so, on planet Earth, in the New Testament especially, you see several mentions of demons and demonic activity. The things that demons will do. You, you'll see instances where someone was demonized and they were blind, or they had a demon that had made them mute, or they have a physical illness of some sort, or the appearance of insanity, or they have an impurity. These are many times not just simply carnal things that, that they're dealing with flesh things, but the scripture will say they had the demon of. Or they cast a demon out who had made the, the person mute. And so you have it in the New Testament, and Jesus went about delivering people. Well, there are demons that pretend to be able to predict the future. And they're referred to as a spirit of divination. Now, the word divination speaks of uh, communicating with the demon for the purpose of obtaining the demon's knowledge in order to make a decision or foresee the future. Divination is an occult practice. And it was and continues to this day to be strictly forbidden in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 9 through 11, God was giving marching orders to the children of Israel. 
And he was speaking about how he was giving them the land. And when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or one who consults the dead. Those were the practices of the heathens, and Israel is not to practice those sins. Well, this young woman had a spirit of divination. Now, it's forbidden to seek them out because it is God who reveals what he desires us to know. We're not to go through other sources or seek other sources. All you know is, you know, I look at my horoscope once in a while. It's kind of fun. We're not to do that. We're not to go to the palm reader. We're not to go to the person there, you know, Madam Lulu who can tell you the future or whatever. We don't do that. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. You see, when God desires us to know, God in the Old Testament would use prophets, his true prophets. Amos 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. In our day, he normally and most often reveals his will through Scripture. So demons cannot foretell the future. Why? They are not all-knowing. They're not omniscient. In fact, when you read the book of Isaiah, God challenges demonic inspired, demonically empowered idols to predict the future. Isaiah 41, 22 through 24. Tell us, you idols, what is going to happen? Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so we may know that you are God's do something, whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed, filled with fear. But you are less than nothing. Your works are utterly worthless, and whoever chooses you is detestable. This woman had the spirit of divination. She was a fortune teller. The word divination speaks of the spirit of python, it was a spirit worshipped as a symbol of wisdom. Someone writing concerning this said, often the priestesses of this demon became agitated and gave answers apparently from their bellies when their mouths remained closed. They were ventriloquists, is what they were. And the people believed her. Notice verse 16, it says, as we went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. She brought her masters much gain. The word fortune telling is literally truth saying. In other words, the superstitious people believed what she had to say. They thought that these diviners spoke by the inspiration of their God, and that means whatever they were saying must be true. So as this is taking place, verse 17, she's following Paul and us, crying out, saying these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. She followed. That word followed is in a Greek tense. It means she continued. She kept following. When it says she followed, she kept following Paul and us and cried out. The word cried out isn't like I'm doing. I'm speaking with a louder volume. She was shrieking. She's screaming. It's, it's not just a loud voice. It's a shrieking voice. It's that screaming, uh, uh, you, know, with, you know, a loudness that you can, you can tell. It's not just raising your voice. It's, it's screaming out. And so as she's doing this, it's... it's, it's in, it's interrupting everything that Paul is trying to do. And notice she's saying in verse 17, that these men are the servants of the Most High God who are claim, well, proclaiming to us a way of salvation. Now, 
One thing about it, I want you to notice, but I'm going to develop it a little further in a different direction, but one of the things about this, she kept on following us. One of my commentators that I use when I'm doing my studies said, the fact that she kept on following them, there may have been something within her that was drawn to them, hoping that somehow that she would be set free. She was in, in bondage. She may have, may have hoped that they would help her. Uh, she was in bondage. Notice it speaks concerning her masters. The word master speaks of those who were controlling her. And so it's possible she, she kept following them, maybe within herself, a hope to be set free. But she's saying these men are servants of the Most High God. And the revealing salvation, something she needed. But verse 18 says she did it for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. He came out immediately. Now, I want to develop this. Notice how it says in verse 18, she was continually doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed. That word annoyed speaks of being exasperated. He was troubled. He was fed up. She keeps following him. She keeps shrieking. And every word she's saying may be true. But Paul is greatly annoyed of it. Now why? Because it's interrupting his ministry. But somebody says, but, but her witness is true. We need to remember that Satan sometimes will speak truth. But he always adds a twist for his own benefit. Understand that. He sometimes will speak truth. He's speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if you cast yourself down from the pinnacle of this temple, isn't it written that the angels have been given charge concerning you and that he will lift you up lest you dash your foot against the stone? Remember in those temptations that Jesus went through, the three temptations, one was cast yourself from the pinnacle of this temple and the angels will hold you up and that'll demonstrate to everybody where else would it be a... Where would be a better place for this to happen than outside the temple where people come to worship? But the problem when he said that, yes, the scripture says he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And yes, the scripture said uh, that they will hold you up lest you should dash your foot against a stone. Yes, but you forgot the whole scripture said uh, to keep thee in all thy ways. And so we don't tempt the Lord God, see? So the devil can quote scripture. The devil can proclaim Jesus as the way of salvation. But he always adds a twist. And that's why when someone knocks on your door and they're representing Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons for that matter, or you hear something from a Christian scientist. Or sometimes you may hear a Muslim say, well, Jesus was a prophet. Or you might hear a, a Buddhist a monk who would say, well, he was a great teacher. They will say th things about him. But they're not completely true. This woman is speaking the truth, but in doing so is going to cause real problem. Now, why is that? Because the fact that the demon is bearing testimony of their ministry undermines it. How? Well, the Jews would be led to believe that the apostles are in agreement with demons. And that means they'll harden their hearts against the preaching of the gospel. But the Gentiles finding that their own demon was bearing testimony to the apostles, would think that it's one system, which would mean they have nothing to learn and nothing to correct, which again would make the preaching of the apostles useless. Her constant shrieking is interrupting Paul's efforts to minister. She's shrieking as he stops to speak. So somebody can't approach him and say to him, I, I was wondering... He can't minister to somebody because she's there screaming in his ear. So where he and his team are going, everywhere they're going, this woman is following behind. And so Paul is grieved. He's finally upset. But who is he grieved by? It isn't that he's grieved with the woman. He's going to set her free. He's grieved at the Spirit. Notice verse 18. Paul Greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. He's grieved by the woman, not by the woman, but by the spirit, by the demon. He's annoyed that the enemy is interrupting the preaching and the teaching. People are being distracted. They're being confused. The woman is saying these men are true ministers, but the teaching of what that means is being interrupted. It went on for several days. 
And finally, he simply casts out the demon in the name and the power of Jesus. And that's something Jesus said that his followers would do in Mark 16, 17. He said, in my name, they shall cast out demons. And it reveals that it's Jesus who sets captives free. The demon came out of this woman, this girl, immediately. It had no power to resist the mighty name of Christ. Now, sometimes, and we'll roll to a conclusion, sometimes people may think that these incidents are simply growing up scary stories. Kind of, you know, the kukui stories, those kinds of things. You know. These are true stories. There are demonic powers. A couple of things. I, I told the, uh, the, a true incident to the first service. I'll, I'll repeat it to you. It's a true incident. And sometimes, sometimes people think that pastors just make up stories. And some do. This isn't made up. When, and I'm going to develop this with you. When the Holy Spirit began to move when we were saved in, in genuine revivals, God begins to move in powerful ways. And I'll share something about that in a moment. And there are people who are actually, actually um, held captive that are set free. I got saved in December 27th, two days after Christmas, and my dad, as a joke, bought me a Ouija board. Yeah, a Ouija board. He thought it was funny. I wasn't saved yet. It was December 25th. I got saved two days later. So dad thought, this is kind of a funny gift. I'll buy my son a Ouija board. Now, people don't know what a Ouija board is. Some don't. Most of you would. I'd say 99.9%, but it's called Ouija. You know why it's called a Ouija board? Because it's a compilation of two different words, we and ja. We in French, ja in German, it's the yes, yes board. And it's used as a parlor game. I'm not going to tell you how it's used. Some of you already know. And I'm not going to teach you how to use it. I will say this, that it has letters of the alphabet and different, different, different things on the board and some kind of little, little uh, cursor of some sort. So I come walking into the house. Now, I'm now saved. I haven't been saved a week. And I, I come walking in the house. My mom and my sister Madeline, Madeline had come to faith in Christ, but she's a brand new Christian. And so my mom and, and Madeline had the Ouija board out. And I walk up, and they're sitting there, and my sister Madeline, a very innocent, sweet woman, young woman, she says, look, David, it works. We're asking it questions, and it's answering us. And I said to her, and I wish I could remember the exact wording, but I said, that's garbage. You shouldn't be messing with that. Now, I'm a whole week old in God telling you what to do. But you shouldn't do that. That's demonic. Oh, no, it's just a game. I said, you shouldn't be using that. That's demonic. Because I was taught, read your Bible. I was reading. I'm seeing demons already. I started with Matthew, and I'm going through the Gospels. And I'm seeing demons all over the place. And naturally, I see the Ouija board. And I say, and my sister, oh, it's just a game. Watch. And I'm standing there. True story. I'm standing there. And she says, Ouija board. She says, you have to ask your questions. Ouija board. Do you like David? She puts her hand on that thing. My mom. No. It spells out N-O. And I'm just looking at it. I don't like you either. It says, no. <laughs> and she says, why? And it, their hands are moving on the board. No respect. And I look at it. It's weird. I'm a brand new Christian, but I, had, I was taught to carry a Bible in your pocket. I dropped it on the board. And it writes... Now, see, I don't tell this story because people think I'm making it up. I'm not. It writes, their hands on it, take it off. It burns. And I said, you're going to burn, and I'm talking to the board. 
you're going to burn in hell for denying Jesus Christ. I'm a brand new Christian. I took the board, took it to the fireplace, and burned it. That's what I did with it, right? Now, there were things happening when I first got saved. And I want to share with this as a conclusion. In Matthew 12, 43 through 45, listen to this. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And so shall it also be with this wicked generation. When the Lord Jesus Christ began to do works, first we need to remember that the foundation and I'll just take a moment. The foundation of this nation was built on Christian principles. The laws and everything else were built on Christian principles, believe it or not, or like it or not, it was. And at first there was this desire, you see it there in monuments in Washington, D.C., scriptures everywhere, sermons everywhere. It was very, very scriptural, everything. And then people would walk away and then it would get evil and then there'd be a revival. A great awakening, they call it. There were a couple of them. And then things would change and once again the nation would return to its moorings. In the Jesus movement, God was moving in a powerful way. I believe it was a genuine revival. There's no doubt. We saw many supernatural things that we thought were ordinary normal I was at a revival some guy fell fell down outside they carried him in put him on the platform in front of me I was at a, at a what they called a kneeling bench I was praying that God would just fill me with the spirit and and they, they placed this guy in front of me and I'm a brand new Christian I'm no more than three weeks old in Christ and this guy's laying there. They actually dragged him in, placed him in front of me. I'm kneeling, looking at this guy. He's right, he's two feet, away, three feet away at the most. And he's just laying there. He had moved from him, then just laid. And I'm praying for the guy. I don't know him. Lord, he fell down. He's, I hope he's okay. And his hand, be, and you're not going to believe this, but I'll tell you, his hand began to move on its own. Went to his chest and like crawled up his grabbed himself by the throat. True story. And I'm going, whoa. His face turned bright red. He was choking himself. And I had been reading my Bible, and it said, in the name of Christ, in faith in him, you can set the captive free. So I said, in Jesus' name, release him. And I took my hand. I'm 20 years old. And it was like I was just turning the page of my Bible, it was that light. His grip was strong enough to make his face turn red and he was choking himself. And I took his hand and I moved it like it was, there was no power in it. So at the very beginning, when I got saved, there were things we were seeing that people would scratch their head and say, how can that be? It was, we saw it, why? Because we knew that God could do anything according to his will. We knew that. We knew that. We were taught that. So we expected him to. This nation was cleansed. There was a powerful moment where God moved and some of the most beautiful churches that, were, that are to this day were birthed from this movement called the Jesus Movement. Calvary Chapel, West Covina, Golden Springs, Calvary Chapel, San Diego, that became Horizon. Harvest, which was Calvary Chapel, Riverside. God was moving in powerful ways. But many people walked away. When the demon leaves, he comes back. And he brings with him seven spirits. And that generation is worse than it was prior to having him kicked out. Who here would believe 
that we would be living in the ways that we're living now? Who would believe that? That you would have men calling themselves women winning women's titles and having judges say that it's okay. Who would believe that? That a man could call himself a woman and undermine all of Title IX and all of the different things that women deservedly should have, but now men are once again doing that and nobody's standing up saying it's wrong? Or who would say that a school can tell a little kid well, if you feel like you're a girl and yet you're a boy, then we won't tell your parents. You, we will, we'll help you to discover who you really are. We'll have women, we'll have men dressed like women come in here for the story hour when you're three years old and four years old and to teach you that it's okay to have drag queens in libraries. When did we believe that would happen? We didn't. It is seven times worse now than it was when I got saved. Why? Because we rejected Jesus Christ as a nation. We have to to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have, what you're dealing with is a spiritual war. You're dealing with a spiritual war and the church is asleep at the wheel. Oh, you shouldn't judge, Pastor David. You shouldn't, these people are, who's saying they're not sweet people, but they're also lost. They need Jesus Christ. Because the enemy is attacking from Genesis where God established marriage. Marriages are being destroyed. Children are being destroyed. Government is being destroyed. And the church is being undermined. He's going all the way back to Genesis right now and undermining the first three institutions you find in the book of Genesis up to chapter 9. Marriage government and the church. That's what's happening. So we as believers, as old-fashioned and ignorant as people think we are, it's time to suit up. It's time to suit up. We're in a war. We're in a war. I had somebody approach me the other day, and I'll close with this. It was a sweet thing for him to say. He said, you know what I've come to realize, Pastor David? And I said, what is that? He said, pastors are warriors. He said, you've been in battle for many years. And I said, that's exactly right. We're warriors, and we stand against the enemy. But we don't stand alone. We stand with Jesus, and we have people who follow Christ, who go with us as we win the world for Jesus Christ. That's how it's supposed to work. So I invite you to be part of the battle, to be part of the battle. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into subjection every thought into the captivity of Christ. We have the word and we have the power. We have the weapons and we have the victory. And we need to open our mouths and speak it and live it. That's what God has called us to do. So this wasn't just a story. This is what the enemy does. This is how he works.